My name is Richard Benjamins. I'm the Group Director of Business Intelligence and Big Data for Telefonica, and I will talk about how to create value with big data. Rather than explaining you what big data is, I would just let you uh, explain the data itself. Yeah? So what you're going to see is four, uh, four stories about uh, data and how it can or how it could create uh, value. The first one is um, what you see is the city of Mexico. It was in 2012 in the south of Mexico. It was an earthquake. Uh, and, uh, about 30,000 houses were demolished. Uh, luckily, only two people got killed. But we have an operation in Mexico, and we see all the calls and the texts that people sent. So what we did is uh, what you see in the following uh, picture. So here you see activity. This is people calling and texting normally. Uh, this is just a few seconds before the earthquake, during the earthquake, during the aftershocks and after. Yeah? So after a few seconds, you see an increasing amount. So this is when 7.4 earthquake hits. You can clearly see where, which parts of the city are more affected than others. Then it slows down a little bit. Uh, and when you see the aftershock, there are other regions in the city that are um, highlighting up. This is the, the moment of the aftershock. Now, this is not analytics. This is just visualizing what's happening. Yeah? It's descriptive. It's the simplest part of big data. But imagine the value this can create for public administration, for governments, to learn what is happening during disasters. And imagine you could have this in real time, where you could really optimize uh, in real time the disaster management uh, process. Yeah? This is in 2012. At that time, we just started our big data uh, uh, journey. It's a long journey. We're still underway. And before that, this data was just considered as an exhaust. Yeah? We needed the data all. Oh, the data was generated automatically by the network. But then when, it, uh, when the network uh, works well, you just get rid of the data because it, it, sto it, it takes a lot of space. Now we've learned that there is a lot of value in this. Yeah? <coughs> Here I have another story, a completely different one, but also very influential. Yeah? Any, anybody has an idea what, what you see here? Well, definitely it's a, it's a heat map. Yeah? And actually, so it's a heat map of uh, people who are at, this, at positions uh, during a certain time. Yeah? So the darker the color, the more people or the more time people are spending on a certain area. Well, this is just about soccer. Yeah? So the top is Barcelona, and the, the bottom is uh, Atletico Madrid. So this is the 2012-2013 league, the Spanish league. Uh, every game uh, has a lot of cameras watching each player from three angles, so they can track every every player individually, and the cameras are taking 10 photos a second. Yeah? So imagine in one hour and a half, there are many photos. And this is just uh, doing something with, with the data. Yeah? You can actually see here that uh, Barcelona is a very much uh, forward-playing team, whereas Atletico Madrid at that time was more a defensive team, yeah? because they are, so you see the, the goals, uh, the goalkeeper on the top left, the top right, and, and the bottom left. Now, with the same data, you can also plot individual players. Yeah? So the green line is the player that runs five meters per second, seconds, and the uh, red line is about seven meters per second. Yeah? I think we can all run that if, uh, in, if we are good in shape, but to do it a lot of times during game is uh, requiring a lot. Yeah? So this guy is running quite a lot. Yeah? This guy is running much less. Yeah? Now, if you were a coach or a team, uh, a, a trainer, what player would you buy? Smart one at the bottom. Yeah, yeah okay. That's, that's an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting answer. Now, if you look at the players, yeah, so this is uh, Xavi Hernandez, Barcelona player. Uh, he just actually left Barcelona a, uh, a few months ago, uh, but very, very good player and running a lot. Yeah? And the bottom player, as you may guess, is uh, Messi. And uh, you may ask yourself, uh, if Messi would run much more, would he even be a, a better player? He's already one of the best, or maybe the best player, but could he even do better? Uh, <clears throat> or is he just a master yeah, of managing his energy? Yeah? Well, uh, judge for yourself. <clears throat> 
So this is a game of Messi uh, some years ago. As always, Messi is running around, not losing the ball. Uh, but then what happens is he has to recover. Eh? This is the same video. He has to recover for a few minutes. So basically, he, uh, I think that's the best he can give. Yeah? <laughs> Still a very good player. <laughs> Oh, but he's doing very well. Eh? <laughs> he's doing very well. Okay, here you have, a, have, here have another story. Eh? So, um, I don't know if you have uh, older kids who start to, start to drive. Eh? So, this is an app that uh, checks how you drive. Eh? It sits on your mobile phone. Uh, it can actually also sit within the car itself as a, as a device. Um, and basically, it measures uh, whether you are speeding or you shouldn't whether you are harshly braking, whether you are cornering, or whether you are distracted, so whether you take your mobile. And what you see here actually is my score. I have a score of 78 out of 100, it's not too bad. I'm actually a very boring driver, as you can see. Uh, I have low scores, uh, high scores on speed, on harsh braking, on cornering. I'm a bit worse at uh, distracting, so I often take my mobile, mobile in the car, which of course I shouldn't. Yeah. My excuse is that I'm often in a traffic jam. So. Um, on the, the second graph is my daily commute yeah, and also the events that happened on this daily commute. And if you take all of us together who use this application and you plot it on a map, uh, you see at the top right, uh, you see all the people speeding in Spain at a certain hour of the day. Yeah? Uh, and at the bottom, you see all the events in a city like Madrid. So this is also a huge amount of data and here you can ask yourself, so what is it for? Yeah? What, what's the business behind it? Now, this is uh, actually an insurance uh, which is called uh, pay as you drive. Yeah? So imagine you're a young male, 18 years, you just got your driving license, uh, you have your first car, and you're faced with paying double or triple the premium uh, other people have to pay. So this insurance say, hey, come with us, half of the premium you pay like anybody else on a yearly basis, but the other half you pay monthly as you drive. So if you drive a Friday night, you uh, go very fast, you brake harshly, etc., you pay. You might end up paying even more than you would have paid otherwise. But if you are a boring driver and you Friday night you take the metro, uh, you might end up paying very little in your insurance. Yeah? So it's a new proposition. It's uh, a new product for the insurance industry. And it's completely driven by data. Yeah? Without data, uh, you can't do this kind of stuff. Um, it is true for the insurance companies. It is a, uh, it is a test. It's an experiment. But because if some people pay less, yeah, other people have to pay more in order to, in order to compensate. And of course, what you get here is only people who will pay less. Yeah? Because the soon you understand that you pay more, you will leave. <coughs> Now, here's the last uh, story. <clears throat> the, the best way to, to start this story is that a few years ago, I heard about a university campus they were building somewhere in Asia. And uh, they built the whole campus, all the buildings, all the roads. Uh, even they got the students in. They started to give lessons. But what they didn't construct was the, 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 the walkways. Yeah? So wh how, how the students would walk from one, bay, uh, from one building to another. So this, they delivered the campus, and of course the students started to work, to walk it from the place, and they, in the end, after a few months, there was a, a clear trail of where people actually walked. So what they did is they built the walkways right there where people walked. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> if you look around at uh, campus or large uh, spaces with, <coughs> like, like this, you always have the official walkways, and then you have those shortcuts, yeah? where the, the, the grass, the lawn is away, etc. So uh, actually, this is a very clever uh, approach yeah? to, uh, to build things. And the story of this data is that we can actually do the same uh, before we deliver yeah? an infrastructure. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is the Smart Steps uh, project of uh, product of Telefonica. And here you see three examples of how you can use that data. Yeah? So this data, what you see here is footfall and movement data of crowds. Um, what you see in the map is London, uh, Christmas month uh, 2012. And the red squares is the, temp the 10 top percent 
or where the people are at a certain time of the day, and the orange is the next 10 to 50 percent. Then you can, uh, <clears throat> you can cross that information with gender information or basic demographics, age range, where people live, where people work, or where people, uh, where people are in, in transit. And this is important, relevant information for the retail industry. For instance, where, uh, what's the catchment area? Yeah? Where do my people come from? Where do my customers go to? Uh, or are they going to the competition? Yeah? You can all see this data from this crowd, <coughs> crowd analytics. But it's not only for, uh, for retail. Uh, it's also for public uh, transportation. For instance, the transport industry, if you have, the, for instance, things like the Oyster Card, the, 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 the underground in London knows exactly how their customers behave. But they don't know about their non-customers who happen to take the car or another transport uh, medium. Uh, train companies, <coughs> railway companies, know about their customers, but they don't know what opportunities they are losing to airplanes or to cars, etc. Now, using the data that comes right off from the mobile network, we actually see whether people fly because the mobile disappears and a few hours later it pops up somewhere else. Yeah? It can only be by flying. We don't have tele teleporting yet. Uh, <clears throat> cars are individuals uh, moving around from one antenna to another antenna. And if you're in a train, a bunch of people together, they all switch at the same time from one antenna to another antenna. Yeah? So all this is <clears throat> mobile insights that actually for train companies uh, and, and air, airplane companies are very relevant uh, to understand the, their business and the context in which they operate. And then going back to the, the story I told you at the beginning with the university campus, also where to construct large infrastructures, where to construct large bridges and, and viaducts, etc., is very important to, to this kind of information. Uh, we do a, uh, a few projects with uh, public administrations in cities. For instance, we help them to plan the metro, uh, metro stations, the metro uh, planning. Yeah? Usually what, what they do is they have persons at the inside of the metro and they ask, where are you going? Is it for work or for leisure? Yeah? They do it for a few days. They do it every three years. And with that information, they plan the whole metro system. Yeah? In the mobile network, you see everything. You see where people go, where people disappear, etc., And you can uh, much better plan uh, the information. And it's much more ac uh, accurate, it's much cheaper, etc. Yeah? So <clears throat> this was the, with, with those stories you can see how, um, how big data uh, can help you to, uh, to do interesting things. But uh, creating value from this big data is not, you can't take for granted. Yeah? We, we saw in this morning, it's quite it's quite uh, challenging to do that. Um, there's often lots of talk about platforms and technology, yeah? uh, about Hadoop, about the three Vs, uh, and then there's the data scientist, yeah? the most sexiest job in the world. Yeah? So the guy who, uh, who uh, coined this term, data scientist, uh, he is now, the, uh, he's now Obama's uh, chief data scientist. Yeah? So, <clears throat> Still very important, but it's not only about platforms and analytics. It's about other things as well. Yeah, um, even within analytics, you can look just behind. So all the things we've seen with the stories, uh, most of it is just looking behind. Yeah? Unless if you use it for predicting things. For instance, I can predict where people will start moving, which is important for my planning of the metro or for uh, building infrastructure. Um, there's already a lot of value in just describing what's what's going on because it's so it's so new. Yeah? So the more you go to the right here, the more value you create, you create, but also the harder it is to get there from all perspectives, from technology perspective, scale, from silos, political, etc. But it has to happen. Apart from this, there are other things that you need to do to create value from big data. Eh? And there is already a lot of literature about that. And this is from the HBR says, integrate analytics and cross your entire, across your entire business. Yeah? Don't have a big data department or a business intelligence department, no. And uh, integrate it in all your business. When we started, so we now created a big data and BI group uh, at the group level, yeah? uh, very high in the, in the corporate hierarchy to, to, um, to manifest to the whole organization this is important. We talked to a lot of other companies to share experience, to learn from them. So we also asked Google, can we speak to your big data department? And they said, we don't have that. It's everywhere. Yeah. So that's the journey. Yeah. You have to, to go as a, 
large uh, corporation that's coming from a different world. And that's the utilities, the telcos, and the financial, uh, financial sector, among others. So I said, it's not only about technology and analytics, it's also about data, yeah? it's about processes, use cases, and it's about people. Yeah? It's important to be, uh, to be clear on where are you, what, on which phases on the journey are you in each of those dimensions. So I will briefly look into those uh, different aspects. First, it's about uh, the use cases. Where do you create value with big data? Mark already showed it in the, in the survey. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> usually, uh, those things are started in commercial areas, sales and marketing, upsell, churn, uh, all those kinds of stuff, customer insights. But if you, if, you, if, you reduce, if you limit it to that, you really lose a lot of value. Yeah? So it's not about only about sales and marketing. It's about just optimizing your channels. It's about a new product. So the insurance product we saw is really an innovation, thanks to data. It's about optimizing your operations, optimizing your finance. Uh, and also, as an operator, uh, well, where do you deploy your antennas, your network? Yeah? There's also big things. A lot of them, uh, it's a lot of uh, reduction or optimization of CapEx and a lot of reduction of OPEX are the possibilities. Now, and if you split those things even out, more out, you can get a huge amount of use cases that you can do in each of those sectors. And so we, we counted them just to get an, 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 an idea of the size of applications. And you can easily come to like 80 or 100 use cases. Yeah? So in each of your businesses, uh, you can do 80 different things to create value with big data. Yeah? And of course, where to start is important. But in the end, if you do it right, yeah, in all aspects, uh, in every, it's every use case is about 10 million a year in so cost savings or in additional benefits, so you can sum it up. It, it goes for a large company, it goes to billions and, and uh, billions. Yeah? <clears throat> now here are some of the things that, that we are doing um, across those different areas. First thing, of course, is marketing. Uh, we do some real-time analytics uh, where when you reach your data bundle limit, uh, rather than throttling, uh, what we do is, depending on what you watch, video, for example, uh, uh, just a, a, a few seconds before your bundle ends, uh, you get, hey, do you want a data snack, 500 megabytes more for one euro, yeah? uh, et cetera. If you're doing something that is not so uh, consumption intensive, you maybe don't get it. Yeah? So it's real-time analytics and real-time delivery to the customer. And we see actually, uh, if you look at uh, when you send the alert to the customer, uh, in a matter of minutes, the uptake decreases significantly. Yeah? So there is a difference between 10 seconds, one minute, and 10 minutes, yeah? and then one day. Yeah? So what you get additionally is this whole range of, of real-time uh, value. Yeah? Another example we do is, uh, of course, customer uh, is churn reduction. It's always a big thing in every industry, and also in, in the telco industry. Um, and there we do things about customer journeys. So the channel, the touch points you have, if you go to a shop, then you go to the call center, then you go online. Usually in, in a large organization, those are individual events where they are managed within the call center or they're managed online, but nobody sees the whole customer journey. Yeah? And 50% uh, of all the interactions people do with an operator are part of a larger journey during time. So it's almost never a specific punctual uh, uh, request. Um, <clears throat> video analytics, uh, we have a lot of, we have about 5 million customers and of a few million we see a lot of things, so we do a lot of that, basically on, on the commercial side. Uh, network, uh, so we deploy 3G, 4G in many countries and uh, traditionally operators deploy uh, where the people are, so the more people you have, the more network you need to deploy. But if you take a look at it from a value perspective, then maybe your strategy changes. You don't deploy the network where people live or based on footfall, but actually you can follow the value. Yeah? And you can follow uh, if the value, if important customers move around in specific patterns, then you maybe should cover this uh, journey rather than putting a lot of emphasis on where people live or where people work because they tend to have Wi-Fi anyway in those places. Yeah? 
So <clears throat> benefits you get out of this is the industry tells if you want to optimize CapEx, you get about 10, 15%. So, and if you are a big operator like Telefonica, that means a lot of, uh, a lot of um, money. And if you apply it to additional revenues, uh, that means that you keep deploying the same thing, but you de deploy it more where the value is, then you can get up to 1% extra uh, additional revenues, yeah? which is also quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of money. But then there are less uh, sexy things like procurement. Yeah? So if you are a large corporation, uh, the first things that large corporations centralize almost always is procurement. Yeah? It's not IT, it's not marketing. Actually, marketing will be the last. Yeah? IT is before. But procurement is mostly centralized in big organizations. Why? Because the scale drives the price down. Yeah? So Telefonica is about spending 25 billion a year in, in buying things. Now imagine, if you, if you could dive into that information, if it's all in one place, uh, and, and, and you could optimize half a percentage, you have 125 million annually, just bottom line. So it's a huge opportunity, and uh, traditionally or typically in, in, in the big data space, it's not applied to those kinds of things, but it's a huge opportunity. Yeah? And it's relatively easy because procurement department, because there is such a financial incentive, usually they're centralized even in one platform. So you don't have to uh, worry about getting the data from 20 places, it's just there. And then M2M. Internet of Things, so connected devices, connected things. Uh, we, we, st we have a business, of course, in M2M, it's several hundred million, so it's, it's an important business uh, where we provide managed connectivity to a, a range of customers like, uh, what is it, Tesla, Amazon, uh, um, a lot of devices, fleet management, etc. And uh, we get the data from all those SIMs, which are across the country uh, on a daily basis updated. And that rather than that has changed the way we manage uh, the business and also change, is changing the way how, uh, what is our customer relationship. Because it's not anymore every month uh, we have to pay so much as operation cost and we have to bill so much to our customers, but we can actually see uh, what is happening, what is a driver of extra cost. For instance, if you have roaming agreements, if a customer of ours uh, roams to a different partner because of a configuration error, uh, in, a, in a country, then uh, our revenue stay the same, but our costs are increasing. Uh, are, are increasing yeah? So we can just see that now and we can take, take action. So some of the, uh, these are some of the initiatives that we do, apart from the smart steps. So this is all internal monetization. The smart steps part is external monetization. Yeah? <clears throat> now I'm talking about data. Yeah? So I talked about use cases. So apply it to as many use cases as you can. But of course, if you start, Start with the big ones and the simple ones yeah, to create, to show, be able to show value as soon as possible. That's about data. So uh, companies tend to look at internal data, other uh, product data. So this is an example of our video business. So we see uh, a lot of people uh, watching, uh, watching television. Uh, we can segment that. So this is a, an example of uh, segmentation. So remote control kings is, of course, is kids. Yeah. Who, uh, without uh, five years already, they are much better in uh, and, uh, managing the remote control than others. And uh, you can actually classify people in certain clusters, and you can use that for upsell or for recommendations, etc. Yeah. So and that is uh, very much on the, on the commercial side. Uh, if you do, if you have satellite TV or DTH or non-connected, you you don't know this. Yeah. You just know what people buy, but you don't know actually what people watch. And Netflix is the king of watching the, of, of doing those things. And actually, they looked within content uh, what kind of plots, what kind of actors, what kind of uh, scenes uh, people uh, liked, and then they created their own uh, uh, series, like, which is House of uh, House of Cards. So we're not so advanced yet, but we're we're getting there. But still, this is just our internal data. It's important, but there's so much more to create value. Imagine everything people say on the, so on, on the internet, on Facebook, Twitter, about the, the series, our series we offer, about our content, about our service. Uh, quality of research with, our, uh, with, with individual customers. Um, our call center data, when people call us and they talk about our TV offering, we want to know about that. Yeah? We want to integrate that. Uh, 
data flowing through our, our network, we can see how many people in our network are using uh, Netflix. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can see that at an aggregated, uh, aggregated level. So there is a lot of data out there, which is not your typical internal data, but it's external and internal, and it's getting all this data together and create this uh, 360 or even uh, 720 yeah, uh, degrees view on your customer and your product. This is a, a, a big cultural challenge for companies because social media is in the marketing department, they do a great job. Qualitative research in, this, in the customer research area, and then there is the BI people who see the data, and they're normally not linked up, yeah? they're silos. <clears throat> and then it's about people. So you can have great data, you can have great insights, but in the end, you need a lot of people to show that there is value and to bring it into practice. Yeah? And, and one of the first chances, uh, challenges is the, the, the top, the senior executives. Yeah? And uh, so for senior executives, it's difficult to understand uh, what is the importance of, of data. Yeah? Now, that is, that is changing now a lot. Uh, I think there are the big companies, most of them are getting it, and they're different in how, to, uh, how they execute it. But there's a lot of companies who still uh, haven't, uh, are, are, have still are struggling with that. So you need to convince those, those people, and that may actually change how they, how, they, how they change. I saw recently a picture of a boardroom of Procter & Gamble and the walls, instead of having uh, decoration, they were screens yeah, with a lot of dashboards uh, projected from uh, computers that explain how the business is going. So rather than speaking about uh, opinions and about experience, it's about, hey, the data is like this and we should take it into account. Now that's, that's very important. But it's, it's all, all across the organization. Yeah? Managers who, who used to uh, manage products uh, whole their life. They don't like mathematics. They don't like this analytics. They don't understand it. They see it as a threat. So you have to get them on board. Um, there are some examples who publish about it, like New York City. Uh, they found out that you have to break the silos and actually did it. Uh, data culture is a lot of blogs and a lot of literature about what does it mean to build a data-driven culture. It's very important. We also see one of the, the main challenges we have is not technology. It's the silence, it's the politics. But then you need to roll out this, uh, this data culture across the organization. If you keep it in a happy 50 or 100, then you will never scale across the organization. You will never create this big value in the end. Yeah? CIOs need to be on top. Um, a lot of people, yeah. But in the end, what we want, we want to get rid of this one, yeah, the hippo. It's the highest person's uh, paid opinion. Yeah? The boss saying, we are doing this, and then everybody is doing that, regardless of whether uh, the data tells us uh, it should be, should be otherwise. That's a big challenge. Yeah? We have to get uh, rid of the hippos. <clears throat> and then you have to empower the people. Yeah? And that goes all the way from the data scientist who you have to give courses, you have to give them challenging things, otherwise they will move over. They don't like to do uh, repetitive things. The people on the ground, in the shops, uh, the sales force, etc., you have to give them the tools. Product design is not like anymore, you design a product, you launch it, and that's it. And you cash in and you do start doing something else. No, during the design, you have to be very lean. You have to build a product, a minimal product, minimal viable product, you have to launch it, you have to look at the data, what part of the product people like, what are they using, what are they not using, are they engaged, are they not engaged, and you need to drive the design interactively with that. That's a completely a cultural change, a digital culture. With a startup or a company like Google or Facebook, they have it in their DNA, they do it by nature. Uh, a, a traditional organization uh, like us or a bank isn't doing that by nature. The managers themselves, you should empower them with tools so can, they can do their own predictions. What customer I have uh, is going to upsell yeah? or is going to churn? I don't need to send a request to a central department. Uh, hey, can you tell me of all those customers? With? No, I can do it myself. Yeah? It's about empire, empowering people across the organization with the skills. Yeah? Um, so it goes all the way down, and you need to talk to all those people. All those people need to be on board to be able to scale out uh, the promise of big data. Otherwise, it will just get stuck somewhere in the, in the value chain. So the question is, if you're such an organization, where are you? Yeah? What's your, what is your challenge? 
are you good at technology? Are you good at use cases? Are you good at people? But at some time or another, you can start at different areas, but you have to be good at all of them in order to create uh, the value. Thank you very much for your attention.